my name is Jasper Bors, and I'm the president, uh, I'm, excuse me, I'm the speaker's director at the Buckley Program. Uh, I want to introduce everyone to uh, Hovik Manassian, our membership director, who will be moderating this event with me. Uh, welcome to the Zoom lecture uh, titled The Constitution in the Time of Coronavirus with Professor Josh Blackman. Uh, before we introduce Dr. Uh, Professor Blackman formally, we just want to say a few words about the Buckley Program uh, and this What I Would Have Said webinar series. So first, for those of you who don't know, the uh, Buckley Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We do so in a variety of ways, including hosting lectures, dinner seminars, fire line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley Program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere at Yale, especially at a university where the, where, where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Uh, all Yale undergraduates uh, and graduate students are eligible. If you are a fellow, please share this opportunity with your peers. Uh, this lecture is the second installment in our new What I Would Have Said lecture series. Uh, it's held in a similar spirit as our disinvitation dinner, which would have happened uh, last month. This online series will provide a platform for speakers who have been disinvited or disrupted, and we're thrilled that Professor Blackman has agreed to be our second guest in this new initiative. And please stay tuned for uh, future Buckley programming, um, including future installments of the What I Would Have Said webinar series. Now on to Professor Blackman, who Hovik will introduce. Like just so Thanks so much, you. Jasper. Hi, everybody. Uh, professor Blackman is a professor of constitution. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. Uh, professor Blackman is a professor of constitutional law at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, yeah, Professor Blackman specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He is the author of several books, including Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. Uh, Professor Blackman has twice testified before the House Judiciary Committee on the constitutionality of executive action on immigration and health care. An adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, he is the founder of, and president of the Harlan Institute, the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the internet's premier Supreme Court Fantasy League, uh, and blogs at joshblackman.com. Uh, he is the author of nearly five dozen law review articles, and his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, and LA Times. Uh, Professor Blackman, I'm going to ask you about Fantasy SCOTUS later, because I think I might want to join. That sounds really cool. Uh, before we get started with um, our first round of questions for Professor Blackman, um, I just want to say that we are going to lead in with a few questions from Hovik and myself, uh, and then we'll move on to audience uh, Q&A. And uh, for those of you watching at home in the audience, you can just submit a question by going to the Q&A uh, icon on the bottom of your screens. So uh, we'll do our best to get to all of the questions um, in a timely manner, uh, and we'll wrap up around 5.30. So with that, I think Hovik, you have the first question for Professor Blackman. Hovik? 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 Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, hello? Yeah, yeah. all right, cool. Um, so yeah, so there, uh, Professor Blackman, I was very interested about your thoughts on the Second Amendment. Um, there's been a lot of debate surrounding the Second Amendment during this time. Um, one of the main questions is, do gun stores qualify as an essential business? Uh, I was wondering what you thought about that and specifically what the Constitution, maybe not outright says something about this, but you know, how can we interpret the Second Amendment during the time of the coronavirus? Well, well, thank you so much. And first, a word about Mr. Buckley. Uh, I'm a longtime fan. I'm a fan of your program. In fact, I was heckled uh, at a speech I gave several years ago at a law school in New York. They tried to shut me down, but I wouldn't be shut down. And I ended up giving my talk, so I feel very much at home in the, uh, in the Buckley program. Uh, so the first question we had was about the Second Amendment. Um, we are in a very strange place now. Um, almost immediately after the COVID virus exploded in our country, 
um, local governments started enacting policies that were unthinkable, you know, even a few days earlier. Um, states erected checkpoints at borders to stop people from traveling. Governors were looking for people with New York license plates and tell them to turn around and not come into Rhode Island. Um, in my home state of Texas, if you tried to cross from Louisiana into Texas, um, hold on a second. Uh, and in my home state of Texas, uh, people crossing the border were given forms saying they were required to quarantine for some period of time. And this was very striking. This was very surprising. Um, and then states began to enact laws restricting things that people think are important. So in Texas, Texas put restrictions on access to abortions. They said that there's a limited amount of personally protective equipment, and we don't have enough to perform certain types of abortion procedures. And in blue states, they put restrictions on gun stores. They said that gun stores are not essential and that we can't have people congregating um, in gun stores. And invariably, people challenged these actions in court. And people went to court and argued that these restrictions are unconstitutional. Now, I'll start with the Second Amendment, because that's the question you asked. Um, stores are generally open, right? If you're a grocery store, if you're a hardware store, different types of stores are open. But why not gun stores? Well, they said we don't want people congregating. I'm sorry, limiting on because if you can have proper social distancing and, and hygiene in a grocery store, uh, why can't you have it in a gun store? So the answer comes down to what's essential, right? What's very important to people? And for a lot of people, guns are not very important. Who needs a gun? Why would anyone need a gun? Well, the Supreme Court has spoken on this issue, and there's actually a constitutional right to have a gun. And in today's world, the only way to have a gun is to buy it once you make one um, yourself. Um, so I think what we're dealing with is uh, a, a decision about what it means to be essential, right? And I think the courts so far have, have danced around the Second Amendment issue. They haven't had to resolve it. But I think at least one or two states are still banning gun stores. And I think it's been really problematic for these states if it ever goes to the high courts. But I do think that a total ban on selling guns uh, uh, would be unconstitutional now. Uh, so one question I have is just kind of broadly to frame this discussion, you know, who's really in charge right now? Is it is it state authorities? Is it federal authorities? Um, I think this issue kind of uh, was clarified recently um, in my home state of Maryland when uh, Governor Hogan sent in the Maryland National Guard to uh, protect a um, shipment of PPE from, or excuse me, a coronavirus tests from uh, the federal authorities who were trying to sort of seize uh, the shipment. So, um, you know, in, in, in that instance, what's kind of the, the precedent for, you know, what, what states are are allowed to do in kind of this time of national crisis and what the, the reach of, of, of the federal government is. Okay, this is unprecedented, right? If you had asked me four months ago, could the governor of a state dispatch the National Guards to take control of PPE so that the feds won't steal their N95? I was like, what are you, insane? That's never gonna happen. Well, it happens. Um, so I, I'm actually somewhat conflicted upon this, right? Um, I don't like is competing against each other as a general matter. Um, I don't think we have a, a, I don't think we should have a single federal government dictating how states should behave. And if one state has some sort of comparative advantage, I don't think they're obligated to share it with the other states. Um, now it's trickier to try and prevent the feds from getting at it, uh, but the executive branch can't seize state assets. Uh, indeed, I think you'd have to have a, a, what's called a taking where basically you have to pay the states for their goods. Um, uh, so I, I think that that would be a somewhat problematic, but I, I think it's perfectly constitutional. Hovick? Yeah, um, so also something that's been in the news lately is voting. Obviously we're in an election year and there's been some stuff said about possibly moving the November presidential election. Uh, is there any constitutional support for this? You know, what can we do 
uh, I know California just instituted like mass mail-in voting. You know, what do you think about that? How do we proceed with voting in the time of the coronavirus? Well, generally voting is done by state law. Every state has different laws regarding voting and there's not a single federal law regarding voting. Now, now Congress can uh, basically what's called preempt or modify state voting laws. Indeed, Congress can actually set the date on which electors have to meet and, and how elections can go forward. So the short answer is you would need a statute that both houses of Congress have to agree and the president to sign it, right, to change voting laws. That's not going to happen. Uh, so I, I don't think there's going to be much change in how voting is done at the federal level. Um, the states can modify their voting. They can allow absentee balloting in, in most ways they want. They can allow people to mail in ballots and do other sorts of things. Um, but I think at, at, at bottom, it's going to be a state matter. Uh, now, just a fun fact of trivia, uh, the Constitution doesn't require people vote for the presidency. Um, it's the legislature that decide how the votes are allocated. In the first election after the Constitution was ratified, most states didn't even have balloting for the president. The states just picked who would be president. Uh, so th there's not even a requirement to vote. Uh, so it's certainly not a requirement to vote in a certain fashion. So I think for the most part, elections will stay as they are. Perhaps some states will expand absentee balloting, um, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't see a role for the federal government in, the, in this manner. Um, so another question I had is, you know, when, you know, we're looking back uh, on 2020 and the coronavirus in 20, 30 years, um, you know, how are constitutional law scholars going to kind of envision how this crisis will transform uh, the balance of powers? Is it going to be kind of a period in which the authority of the executive really expands a lot like 9-11 was? Um, with the AUMF um, is kind of the invocation of the Defense Production Act, like a similar um, symbolic uh, policy shift? Oh, you know, I think it's very hard to predict how historians will judge a moment because we, we don't have the hindsight, right? We are in this now and we're living this day to day. Um, I'm always skeptical of saying what will historians think in 20 years? I mean, I was, I was alive during 9-11 when I was in high school. Many of you maybe not, weren't even born yet. Um, not that old, but, uh, 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 you know, historians then, historians now see it differently. Um, I think the short answer of how we're doing the situation at the moment is the federal government's not doing very much. And I think the criticism has been the feds haven't done enough. And I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, I, I, I think it's not the federal government's role to manage health and safety. That's a state function. Um, I think not all states should have the same, um, not all states should have the same approach, uh, right? New York and Idaho don't need the same method of dealing with Corona. Um, so I'm okay with the states bearing it. Um, I do think though that, uh, the, the issue of the Defense Production Act was almost like a tempest in a teapot. And it almost doesn't even matter anymore. I mean, a month ago, people were demanding the president issue orders to produce more ventilators. And now it turns out ventilators aren't that helpful. Um, so I don't think the federal government should be doing much. I think what they do, they're probably going to screw things up. Uh, we're dealing with this sort of unprecedented situation. No one really knows what to do. Um, Virtually every country in the free world has screwed this up in one way or another. Even the countries that have had pretty good responses are now having relapses with these huge surges. Uh, you know, what, where, where, where are we going? I, I don't know, but, but government is not always the answer. They, they can't know the answer to everything. And I think people put false hope in the government, hoping they have the answer, and, and they don't. So, uh, you know, less, less is more. Um, yeah. So another question that I had was, uh, I don't know exactly how far back this was in the news, but there was some word about uh, President Trump dismissing um, one of his, the watchdogs who was responsible for like overseeing the allocation of, of stimulus package funds. And what role exactly does the executive have in, uh, you know, enforcing um, the legislation or the, the specifically like stimulus package type legislation that Congress has passed? Uh, does President Trump have any 
constitutional backing to dismiss this person, this watchdog? Do we even need watchdogs, things like that? Well, look, the, the, the question of whether the president can dismiss watchdogs, um, it, it, sounds, it sounds like it, 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 he can do it. <laughs> he can do it. Um, the, the removal of power belongs to the president. Um, and Congress has put certain limits on that removal power. And as far as I know, the president's followed those limits, right? Um, whether it's a good idea is a different question. Um, oversight is a function performed by Congress generally, but Congress has created these positions within the executive branch to uh, scrutinize things. And it's always tricky when the person in the executive branch is scrutinizing the executive branch. Uh, so I have no problems with these, uh, uh, which we're called inspectors general. I have no problem with them in general. Um, but I, I, you know, from a constitutional perspective, he can do it. He can fire them, and there are political consequences for doing so. Okay, I think we're going to move on to uh, audience questions now. We've already got eight questions. Um, so Jim Turney asks, what are the U.S. constitutional limitations on executive orders limiting or mandating behavior during a pandemic, such as stay at home or closing businesses uh, or physical distancing? Thanks, uh, Jim, for the question. Um, so let's just separate two different levels. Um, we have federal government and we have state governments. Um, most issues of a health and safety are actually governed by state governments and not by the federal government. So it's not likely to see any executive order mandating behavior. Most of Trump's executive orders have been mostly guidance and fluff. Now, I'll just modify your question slightly and ask what happens if you have a state executive order mandating people to stay at home? Well, generally, when the government orders you to stay in one place, they need a good cause, right? They need some sort of justification. Um, police power, let states dictate health and safety. Um, but I think that these orders, um, how do I put this? The need for these orders, I think, fades over time. Um, as we've learned more and more about Corona and how it's transmitted, how perhaps to prevent transmission, the justification for these blanket orders, I think, fades. So maybe these sorts of orders could have been valid in March and April. I think they become less valid in May and June. And then we get to July and August, it's a very different position. So I, I think that the courts may start intervening. I mean, these are mass infringements of civil liberties forcing people to stay in their houses in a penalty of arrest, right? We, we've never had this tradition in this country. The closest I can think of was during World War II, we locked, uh, um, uh, we, we had Japanese internment. And generally we don't look faithfully upon locking people up uh, 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 in their homes, but we sort of just accepted this as just like, oh, whatever, you know, but flatten the curve, no big deal. Um, you know, people can voluntarily choose to stay home, but arresting people who leave their homes um, it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. Now I'm in Texas. Now we, I went to a restaurant yesterday, people seeing they're eating dinner. It was almost strange to see. I, I take out it's strange to see, but I think there are some limits on these powers, but thank you, Jim, for that question. So the next question, uh, as to the lawsuits that are being filed by businesses, businesses attempting to reopen or to lift operational restrictions imposed by local health officials or governors, what sorts of constitutional arguments are being made by plaintiffs, dormant commerce clause, equal protection, privileges and immunities, privileges or immunities, and which arguments do you believe will have the most success? Okay, I think so. another, another Josh for the question. Um, businesses have generally tried challenging um, these orders, and they've done so on several grounds. One, they've done so on various constitutional grounds. So you mentioned the Dormant Commerce Clause. This generally prohibits discriminating against out-of-state businesses. Uh, you mentioned privileges and immunities. That, that's a clause that gives you a right to travel. Um, but most of the cases involving businesses haven't been based on the federal constitution. They've been based on state law. For example, does the, the, did the legislature give the governor this power? or does this power belong somewhere else, right? Is there authority here to do this? Uh, most constitutional challenges to economic regulations are not very successful. The courts have said, we're not going to scrutinize um, state laws in this fashion. We're going to defer to the political process. So it's unlikely we'll see these sorts of 
uh, a dormant commerce clause or privileges and immunities cases succeed, but we have seen state delegation cases. Thank you for the question, Josh. Okay, uh, our next question. Um, what's the point of a lockdown if everything is deemed essential other than restaurants? Uh, the point is that people, um, yeah, sorry, that's so that, that's that's a question. What is the point of a lockdown if everything is deemed essential other than uh, other than restaurants? Okay, well, let's talk about this. So um, the governments have been fairly um, imprecise in what essential. So restaurants are covered, manufacturers of food are covered, um, manufacturing of candy is covered. Uh, for example, before Easter, Pennsylvania allowed the Peeps, you know, these little marshmallow Peeps, they allowed the Peeps factories to open. Are Peeps essential? Um, you know, different types of businesses that aren't very important have been deemed essential. Um, you know, construction has been deemed essential. Do we really need to build new houses now? Um, when you have a law with so many exceptions to it, you start questioning, well, why are things included, but some other things are not included? Um, as for guns, um, the Supreme Court has said that we have a right to have a gun. Um, and do you think that right to the gun is a little bit more important when police officers are saying we can't help you and they're releasing criminals onto the street? I think there are actually compelling reasons why it's very important in times of crisis because you can't rely on the state to protect you. Um, if you have a flat out ban on something the Constitution protects, then the courts, I think, can get um, involved. But even before we get to the Second Amendment, the distinction of what is and is not essential, I think, is completely arbitrary, right? Why can 50 people sit next to each other in an airplane, but 15 people can't sit across each other at church, right? Why, why, why can people go to a store to buy, you know, uh, whatever random product they want to buy, a stapler, right, or paper for a printer, um, but you can't practice social hygiene in a gun store? Uh, where you can stand far apart from people and, and not, not touch things. Uh, you know, I, even I went, if you go to pick up food, you have to sign the stupid credit card slip. You have to touch stuff, right? There, there, there's touching involved everywhere. And I think when you have uh, the government saying what is and is not essential, that's be some, some better sense of, um, you know, what they're thinking about. Yeah. So the next question says, please explain the relationship of the 14th Amendment's privileges and immunities and the First Amendment's peace, peaceably to assemble in relation to states' restrictions on group meetings. Sure. Uh, so the First Amendment guarantees the right of peaceable assembly, and that generally gives you the right to protest in various fashions. Um, the 14th Amendment has what's called the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And at least in my perspective, that, that limits state power and ensures that states can't run about the First Amendment. Um, we've seen these protests. People are simply going to state capitals with their AR-15s on their backs and their flags flying high, saying we have the right to protest. Um, these orders are significant infringements in civil liberties. You can't protest, right? You, you, know, you, you can't protest on Zoom. It defeats the purpose if you're sitting here at home on your phone you can't send the same sort of message to, um, to the public. Now, um, so far the courts have not intervened. Um, I know there's cases pending in various states arguing that these lockdown orders are unconstitutional, uh, but so far we haven't gotten very far. I think that, um, you know, the question before was Jasper asked, how will historians see this time in the future? This is one area that we looked at very carefully, um, how quickly people willing to shut down rights of protest to, uh, to try to flatten the curve, which we don't hear much about anyway. We don't, we don't talk about flattening the curve. The curve doesn't matter anymore. It's now, now on to other things. Thank you for the question. So our next question is coming from Aaron Hull. And he says, building upon the voting question, uh, that was Hovix, I think, are there any rationales to deny mail-in ballots as US military forces would be effectively disenfranchised? Um, yeah, I think so. And by the way, Aaron is a high school teacher in Greenwich, so not, not too far from here. Um, or here. No, no one's actually, is anyone actually in New Haven or is it just like an empty campus now? I don't even know. I think it's very no one there. Anyway, um, so to answer, answer Aaron's question, um, I, I don't think anyone is uh, blocking mail-in ballots. I think the question is, 
uh, what are the reasons why you have an absentee ballot? Uh, one of the reasons why you'd get an absentee ballot is if you overseas the military. Uh, but what if you're here, you're, you're in the state of Texas, and your only reason for a ballot is that you don't want to go outside because of Corona, right? Is the existence of this pandemic itself a justification for an absentee ballot? And if that's the case, then 100% of the electorate should get an absentee ballot, whereas the law only gives absentee ballot for certain types of causes. So I think the courts will decide, at least in my state and others, whether these old statutes considered giving 100% of the population absentee ballot. Thank you for the question, Aaron. So this next question comes from uh, Daniel Black, and he says, what makes the federal government not the answer with regard to national pandemics such as coronavirus, as opposed to, say, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor? Should American response there have been let to the state, left to the state? I think I heard uh, most of the question. I hope it just can't uh, cut out. Um, the, the question was, uh, why was Pearl Harbor required a national response and not Corona? <clears throat> um, even the most ardent libertarian would argue that the federal government has some powers, and they certainly have powers over foreign affairs. And if we're quite literally attacked, I think that that falls on the federal power. Um, indeed, the states are incompetent. States cannot even maintain armies. They cannot forge the trees. They cannot engage in military intervention. So I think something like Pearl Harbor is something that only Congress can respond to. Uh, but we've had epidemics before. We've had outbreaks of diseases going back to the time of the 1790s. You know, the Supreme Court in the 1790s had to shut down because of yellow fever in Philadelphia. And at all junctures, states managed to uh, protect their people. And I think that's the, the starting line. Uh, the federal government can certainly provide backup support for this and coordination, but uh, I don't think the states should be told what to do. I don't think the states can be told what to do. They can be given suggestions. Thank you for the question. Uh, next question is from David Stern, and he says, is there any reason to be optimistic that the failures of the FDA and the CDC uh, in early 2020 might lead to reform um, of those agencies? Uh, this is probably about my pay grade. I don't know much about health policy. It's not my thing. Uh, but my general theory is I don't trust government in general. I think they're incompetent. Um, uh, and I don't say that in a mean way. I think just generally governments can't do what we want them to do effectively. Um, uh, 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 prove me wrong, maybe, maybe, maybe they can. Um, when you have these sorts of black swan events, these global pandemics come out of nowhere, governments become caught flat-footed um, and they will make mistakes. And I, I'm okay with that. I think they, they're going to screw up. Um, would I want something better? Sure, but I'm not optimistic. <laughs> This next question comes from Caroline Thompson, and she asks, could you maybe speak some on the intersection of the quarantine orders and attending religious services? Oh, very good question. Um, you've probably seen pictures on Twitter and elsewhere of airplanes, right? People sitting three in a row, packed deep for three hours on a closed plane with no ventilation. Um, that's perfectly okay. Uh, but you've probably also seen houses of worship that want to have cars parked next to each other. And governors say, no, you can't even park your car next to someone because you might give me a break. Um, if you are allowing people to socially distance in certain places, churches should not be excluded. Houses of worship should not be excluded. I think it's entirely reasonable to allow people to practice good hygiene in a house of worship. Certainly in their cars, I, I, I don't get the objection to the car worship. Oh, well, maybe they'll get out of the car and go to the bathroom. Oh, yeah, same thing, go to the bathroom at ShopRite or, or, you know, or, or, or Kroger or anywhere else. Um, people go to the bathroom, they, 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 they have to pee, it happens. Uh, so I, I think that so far the, the courts have been pretty good of saying that these houses of worship can't be shut down. Uh, so long as people practice social distancing, now, even if they don't, you know, what, what if, you know, you want to go take a Holy Communion and you touch a wafer and, you know, you know, you're not six feet away from the, the chalice, right? Those issues have not been litigated yet. Um, but I, I, I think the state may be very hesitant. Uh, there's just one video from Italy where a police officer tries to shut down a mass in the middle of the, uh, middle of the uh, Catholic mass. And the priest is like, just send me a fine. And the, the, the the, eventually the police officer goes away, but it, it's, it's stunning to see these things happening in Italy, no less. Oh, so I want to follow up on that question. And uh, so why should the, I guess, why should we say 
because we're not social distancing in airplanes, we should not social distance in houses of worship and not say we should also social distance in airplanes. Yeah, I mean, look, it goes back to the question of what's essential, right? If air travel is really essential, then we're willing to take the risk. If grocery stores are really essential, we'll take the risk that people might, you know, talk in the aisles, of, you know, in aisle five, right, you know, near the vegetables. Um, but governors say, well, religion's not essential. Right? You know, you can pray on Zoom, right? You, you, you can take the community, right? No, look, look, you're laughing, but it's completely serious, right? If you're a governor, you can pray on Zoom just as effectively, why do you need to go to a church, right? You can't Zoom an airplane, right? You can't Zoom a chicken, but you can Zoom a, a prayer. And, and at, at bottom, at base, people have different judgments of the value of religion. And for, for, for people who are more secular, going to religion is no different than going to a movie, just watching stuff, or maybe a book club, right? Whatever, you, you book club them in Zoom, who cares? Uh, next question is from Robert Hogan, and he says, I'm curious about this case. Several states and municipalities have strongly discouraged people from using their second home. What are the limits on this, and can a state ordinance block a property owner from accessing their property absent some, immediately, some immediate health threat? Uh, example being a manifestly sick person. Yeah, first world problems, right? <laughs> People worry about their second homes. Um, bless you, Al. Um, well, I think this question goes, sorry, don't bite the end, it feeds me, right? Um, I, think, I think this question goes more towards the issue of um, uh, limitations on travel. We actually have states limiting how much and how far people can travel. And these are novel restrictions. Um, generally, the government can't stop you, right? You might have a checkpoint where they say, you know, we don't want people going this area, but there's no precedent for this sort of wide range censorship of, of, of stopping people from going to their homes. I don't think these fans are valid. Uh, I think if you actually were to challenge them in courts, they'd be unconstitutional, but <clears throat> during these difficult times, the, the government is sort of just winging it. They're making stuff up along the way. Let's ban this. No, not ban that. No, you need masks. No, you don't need masks. Okay, now you actually need masks, right? The directives change so often. Um, I, I don't have faith in the government experts. I, I think they, they, they're, they're doing the best they can. They're making the best judgments, but I don't pretend what they're saying is gospel. You know, whatever was the, the, the mandatory policy a few weeks ago is no longer the mandatory policy. It, it's changing. We're figuring it out. Uh, so the courts, I think at some point, will start getting a little bit more energetic. So, um, next question comes from Alex McGrath, and he asks, what makes the federal government not the answer with regard to a national pandemic such as the coronavirus as opposed to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong question. No, that's, My that's apologies. One, Alex. No, no, that was from Daniel. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, so the next question, again, comes from Alex McGrath, who asks, in the discussion of Maryland's decision to exclude federal intervention with PPE, you mentioned that the states don't have an obligation to share medical supplies. I thought this was a surprising conclusion. Why does the federal government not have the ability to prevent hoarding? Ah, well, Alex, so a few doctrines are at issue, right? One is called the commandeering doctrine. The commandeering doctrine says that a state cannot be ordered by the federal government to do or not do something, right? So Congress could not tell the state you must turn over, you know, you must, um, uh, uh, collect supplies and give them to the federal government. Uh, the federal government wants them, they can use what's called the taking power to actually seize them from the states and provide compensation. Um, I think the Congress could also regulate um, how private companies um, transport goods across state lines. I don't think Congress can give directives to the states to provide the feds with, with PPE. I don't think it's permissible, I, I don't, unless they're providing compensation. Okay, our, our next one um, asks, how would you compare the emergency posed by a pandemic to the situation posed to Lincoln at the beginning of the Civil War? Um, if an emergency order has validity, how long will that last without supporting legislation being passed? Uh, look, I mean, this is not the Civil War, right? I mean, we're sitting here talking on Zoom, right? No one's dying on battlefields, right? Our country is not being torn asunder. You know, I, I think it's people are, 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 are so eager to compare 
current situations to actual emergencies. I think this is, you know, we'll, we'll be fine. I mean, the, I, I, don't, I don't want to minimize it, but the Civil War, we, we could have ended as a nation. It could just, we could have ended, it, you know, we'd have no more country. We'd be a couple fragmented North and Southern, whatever, right? So I, I don't think the comparison works. But the question is about validity of emergency orders. Um, we haven't had emergency orders, right? The governors are not relying on some sort of inherent power. They're relying on statutory authority. Uh, Congress, the president, for all of his wars, has been relying on statutory authority, right? All the things being done now have been approved by legislatures. Uh, maybe legislatures should not have given so much power to the executive branches, but, but, but there's not really an emergency order. So I, I, think, I think these concerns are sort of overblown. Um, I, I, maybe some of the governors have stepped out of line a little bit, but we're nowhere even remotely close to what happened in the Civil War. So the next question comes from um, Kenneth Wagner, and he asks, would it be unconstitutional for a state government to allow certain types of religious services, but not others based on the degree of importance that the given religion puts on the meeting in question? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll give an example, right? Most states have orders saying, no, you can't have 10 people in a room, right? Nine's okay, but you can't have 10. Um, in, in, in the Jewish faith, um, for certain prayers, you know, it was Indian, a quorum of 10 people, right? It's impossible to do certain prayers in the Jewish faith with these 10 person limits. Uh, now, could the federal government say, okay, well, the Jews can get 10, but not the Catholics? Ooh, I mean, you know, I, 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 I think the, the better answer is you allow people to practice their faith with adequate social distancing, and I think most of these problems will go away. Um, uh, but I don't know that I'm comfortable with the government saying, well, this is really important to let them do it, but not that group. I, that makes me really nervous. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can uh, please keep on submitting uh, questions to the Q&A box um, for Professor Blackman. Uh, next question is from Jim Coyne. He asks, oh, what do constitutional limits on searches uh, imply about mandatory testing, uh, tracking, et cetera? All right. Yeah, I've been giving Sidra some thought recently. Um, we all know this phrase, contact tracing. It sounds awesome. What does it actually mean, right? Some guy knocks on your door and says, you, uh, you send that to this guy on a bus so you have to stay in your house for two weeks, right? You can be perfectly fine. You might be asymptomatic. There are some serious civil liberties issues with contact tracing. They say, okay, and we'll show me your phone and all the people you've texted and all the people you met with. Who the hell are you? You should the government can't ask these questions without a search warrant. Like, I, I'm actually more nervous about the contact tracing than I'm at the coronavirus. I know that sounds awful, but who is the government to demand that you disclose your contacts? All the people you've been with. Maybe you don't want to tell them. Maybe, maybe you're engaged in some conduct that you don't want to publicize. Maybe you're having an affair. Maybe you're uh, 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 getting a tattoo, maybe you're getting an abortion. I don't know. There are lots of people do that that aren't the government's damn business. And what if you tell the contact tracer to get get lost, go away? I don't want to talk to you. They're going to arrest you. They're going to find you. Um, there are lots of countries where you are required to put an app on your phone that tracks you and reveals all the places you've gone, all the places you've been. I don't think that our government can require those apps. And that's why we'll never get good contact tracing. I don't want good contact tracing. It's an awful thing for the government to have that information. It, it rips up the Fourth Amendment. In other words, we can do a lot of stuff that might at the margin shrink the amount of people with coronavirus. Um, uh, we should think carefully before we go down that road. Awesome. So the next question comes from Billy Klein, and he asks, what makes air travel essential when freedom of movement is still possible through personal vehicles? Look, this word, um, this word essential doesn't mean what you think it means, all right? It doesn't actually mean absolutely necessary. It means that some government bureaucrat decided it's important and we can't get rid of it. Um, you know, you can't travel to Europe by plane, uh, but you can travel to the United States by, by car, I'm sorry. You can travel to Europe by plane, but you, you can't drive to Europe by car, right? I guess you have to boat travel, I suppose. Um, I don't know how the government justifies allowing airports to exist right now, right? I mean, I live in Texas, right? I can take a flight from Houston to Dallas 
It's like a 45 minute flight. It's a three hour drive. Why does this flight exist, right? Why can I sit on a flight from Houston to Dallas by a three and a half hour drive? You don't want the airlines to die? I don't know. I'm sure there's good reasons, but I tend to think people can decide for themselves what's essential, right? Like right now, a haircut would be really nice. Now, I, maybe I'll go to that woman in Dallas who got arrested, right? You know, maybe I'll go to her shop for a haircut, but I, I'm choosing not to. I think people can decide what's important to them, what's not important. Those crickets, with no more questions? Oh, Vic, did you have a, another question for Professor Blackman? You're, you're muted, I believe. Oh, we got two more, actually. I've never heard actual crickets, but I have no question. Oh, OK, we've got another one. Um, what makes government intervention definitionally uh, less efficient other than anecdotal evidence? Um, uh, sort of, yeah, that's it's a, quite a long question. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I see. Government is just groups of people collect the resource. Look, I, I actually, I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't have a problem with the government. Um, I'm okay with them making decisions, and I simply assume they'll be probably bad decisions. I don't know that anyone will make a better decision. I, I, I think it's actually a well-stated question. I think we have government for certain purposes, but I don't have high expectations. I think they will do the best they can with their constrained resources. I think in some regards, they'll do a better job than private industry. Um, we vote for them, and they'll be accountable. But I, I just I don't have high expectations. I, and I, I look around the world, and you know, a lot of countries with governments look nothing like ours also screwed up. Some countries are better than others, and, and I think that they, they may have certain unique structures that we don't have. Um, I think our CDC screwed up the testing. They did. It seems, seems, that seems pretty controversial. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't have high expectations. That's the best way of putting it. So um, Alex McGrath again asks, do you think the government can mandate people to be treated? Well, uh, there was another question on the list that wasn't asked, but involved Jacobson v. Massachusetts. Um, this, this case was from the 1903 or so, might be off by a few years. Uh, it involved a smallpox vaccination in Massachusetts. Right? Can, the Fed, can the state government make you take a vaccination? And the court held, yes, they can. Right? That, that the government has the power, the state government has the power to mandate vaccinations. And this was a a non-controversial ruling, this was pretty well accepted. So if the government can make you take a vaccination, can they make you wear a face mask, right? Can they make you wear uh, gloves? Um, can they make you uh, take hydroxychloroquine? I don't know, right? We'll, we'll, do that anymore. we'll talk about that anymore. Right, what can the government make you do? And Jameson basically says during a pandemic or an epidemic, um, they can do whatever they want. Now, the question that was asked before is, is that case still good law? The court has reaffirmed Jacobson many times. Now, as a libertarian, I am skeptical of the case. Uh, sorry. Okay, it passed. You know, I, I, I'm skeptical of the case for sure, um, but I think that it's still good law. I don't know if it's consistent with more recent doctrine, but I think it's still good law. Um, so I'll ask a question now. Uh, what do you make of the Trump administration's efforts to limit immigration um, uh, as a result of the coronavirus? Oh, uh, yes, immigration. Um, I think for the most part, the president's current, is there, is there birds chirping in the background? Povic, that might be you. Uh, I'll, I'll mute myself, my bad. I hear the widest birds turn some here every, year. every time you are here. Time for too long, you start hearing things. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, the, the birds chirping. Um, so the, the question was about the, um, oh, I just posted the question, it just reminded me that. The immigration. And oh, immigration, immigration. Yeah. I think for the most part, the president is doing stuff immigration always is, which is shrink them where people can be admitted. It's just like everything just shrink. Um, there actually are statutes on the books that say you can, you can deny people entry who have, you know, certain contagious diseases, right? You know, imagine someone shows up at JFK airport in New York and he's showing symptoms of Ebola, 
Well, you know, maybe that person should not be allowed in the country. I think we would probably, you know, just, just sit quarantine it for a bit. Don't let them admit have Manhattan. I think we all probably agree it's a good idea. Um, but, but I think what's going on now is they're saying, we're just going to assume everyone's infected and we're going to deny certain people access to visas. We're going to shut down visas. Uh, I think they've also shut down the refugee programs as well. Uh, so I think immigration has come to a standstill. Um, again, the president's acting based on delegated statutory authority. I think it's probably pretextual. To, he's not really concerned about the epidemics, but the statute, um, the statute is there. Um, we have a question uh, which says, Professor, earlier you mentioned that courts may become more energetic in cases regarding social distancing and religious worship. Uh, what characteristics need to be present for the Third Circuit to decide that religious worship must be allowed in person in a socially distant manner? Yeah, um, so the, the student, uh, the, the attendee asked about the Third Circuit. Um, there was a Sixth Circuit decision, I think two days ago on Saturday, which decided the in-person worship. And the court made the argument made before. If you can be packed shoulder to shoulder in an airplane, why can't you be packed shoulder to shoulder in a church? I, I'm not that creative. I still suffer from judges who are smarter than me. Um, you know, if, if you can walk down the aisles of a grocery store, why can't you walk down the pew of a church? Um, and they, they said the ban on in-person worship is um, unconstitutional. Um, uh, so I think you'll see that in other circuits. I'm not sure the third circuit's rule, but the six has. Um, so the next, oh, yeah, hope it goes so the, the next question, how strictly should businesses and the most interesting case, in my opinion, court proceedings keep operations online or at home? How highly should we value the inevitable diminishing of quality with taking extensive health protections? Well, the courts are moving along surprisingly well. Um, for the most part, uh, oral arguments for hearings are presented by telephone or by you know, Skype or, or by uh, Zoom or whatever else. Um, and judges decide cases on briefs, which can be done remotely. The trickier part is criminal. Um, many criminal proceedings have to be done in person. If you want to plead guilty, right? If you want to be sentenced, if you want to have a jury trial, right? Jury trials are done. I mean, you cannot have juries. Uh, you can't have grand juries to investigate and charge people. So there are lots of things that are essential to the criminal justice that are not being done right now. I don't know when that can resume. I mean, do you want to sit in a jury box packed with 11 other people sitting like this, you know, shoulder to shoulder for, you know, a four day jury trial where you can't get up and, 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 and you know, circulate air? Um, I, I, I have not thought through jury trial things would be very difficult. Uh, and another question from Kevin Zhao. He asks, given the delays in courts hearing cases, uh, how would this affect the fifth, the fifth Amendment's right to a speedy trial? Really good question, yeah. The, the, the Constitution guarantees the right to a speedy trial. There's also a statute called the Speedy Trial Act that limits um, how much time can elapse before a person's actually brought up on charges and then when they're brought to court, and et cetera, there are limits. The courts have the power to suspend some of those limits, but not others. Um, I understand that if the defense attorneys wanted to, they could actually demand certain proceedings right away. So far, the lawyers are being accommodating and they're not pushing things too hard. Um, but it gets more tricky when you have um, certain types of cases, for example, immigration cases. Uh, generally, the remedy for what's called legal reentry is they remove you, right? There's no reason to go to jail, they're going to remove you anyway. So in these cases, they want to move right away. And they can't because of these delays. So uh, there are a lot of people who want to get to trial and they can't. And, and I, I have sympathy. We've had this before, for example, with Hurricane Katrina, right? Courts were shut down for months. But that was in one city or I guess a couple cities in the state. Here it's nationwide. So the next question comes from Tanzi. And he asks, what is your take on the partial ban on abortion by Texas during the quarantine period? Um, I'm sorry, just repeat the last part. I didn't hear the last part you said. I'm sorry. Sure. So what is your take on Texas banning partial, partial birth abortions during specifically the quarantine period? Uh, well, uh, the Texas policy is actually a little bit more, uh, a little bit different than that. The, the government said that certain forms of surgical abortions were banned 
um, for a period of time because there's a limit of PPE that has protective equipment. Um, <clears throat> this was litigated back and forth. And at this point now, for the last three weeks or so, there's, there's really no additional restrictions in abortion. It, it's more or less back to normal in Texas. Uh, but there was a restriction for surgical abortion. I think that might be with the of partial birth. Um, the courts basically held that the state has authority to restrict access to PPE. And if the state needs this, they can restrict it from being used for abortions. Uh, you know, also, you know, uh, like, like with the, the uh, colonoscopies, right? Various other elective procedures were also prohibited because they used PPE. Um, now, the abortion uh, proponents say this is pretext. It's really not about banning colonoscopies. You're trying to ban abortion. Uh, I think those cases are more or less wound down. So I think we're, those are behind us. Uh, procedural question. Um, a lot of the issues being discussed have come to the conclusion it's probably unconstitutional, but it will need to time to go through the courts. How will, uh, how with all the limitations in place, will these cases be able to be heard? Um, they won't be. Uh, I think the court's okay with that. Um, a lot of these cases will simply never be reviewed by the courts. Uh, so it leaves the executive branch with discretion to do what they want. Um, when you have a fast moving crisis like the coronavirus, you're not going to have the court be able to apply in time. Um, you know, I'll give you a famous example. During World War II, uh, the Roosevelt administration wanted to execute uh, uh, these Nazis who washed up on the shore of the beach somewhere. They're called the Nazi saboteurs. And the Roosevelt administration had a trial for them, which was basically a shambles military trial. <laughs> the Supreme Court heard the case. And before the Supreme Court actually wrote its opinion, the guys were executed. In other words, FDR didn't wait for the court to issue its opinion to execute them. So the court issued like a one page decision saying, yeah, go ahead, it's, we, we, we agree, it's fine. And then like a month or two later, they wrote this opinion explaining their reasoning. And the guys were already dead, right? So it wouldn't have mattered. So my point is during these sorts of crises, the courts are always sort of the, the, the caboose. They're, they're coming up behind. They're not, they're not the locomotive. Yeah, so the next question comes from David Stern and he asks about the legality of juries through Zoom and what your opinion on those. You know, the question, I don't know if any states have approved of jury service by Zoom. Um, the right to a jury is constitutional, at least in the criminal context. I don't know that a, I don't know that a, a Zoom jury would work. What happens if the internet cuts off, right? What happens if the person falls asleep and you don't see him because his camera's not working? Uh, you have to, you have to keep an eye on the jurors and, and you know, what someone's talking to them, giving them information during the trial. I think that would be very suspect. I don't think that works. Uh, next question from Jim Coyne. And before I ask this, I just want to remind everyone that we have about eight minutes left. So if you have any uh, additional questions, please submit them. Uh, and Jim asks, what are your thoughts about a presidential executive order to limit liability for coronavirus infections affecting uh, employees or customers? Yeah. Um, again, I think, I think the the Congress have to act here. So they're asking about liability, right? Um, let's say that you go to a store and because they didn't have proper cleaning, you contract the coronavirus, right? Can you sue that store for, for some sort of liability? Or let's say you're working in an office and you contract the virus because a customer isn't wearing a mask. Some members of Congress want to create a liability shield. They'll prevent losses based on coronavirus. Uh, as you can imagine, people are not happy with that because they want liability for those things. Um, I don't think that can be done by executive order. I think it has to be done by statute. I don't have a strong opinion on it. I think Congress could uh, restrict certain commercial transactions in that regard, uh, but I think I would want to see the bill before I comment for sure. So the next question is from Bobby uh, Beatty, and he asks, what is the least threatening crisis that you would think the government can justify such restrictions? Geez, what a good question. The least threatening crisis. This, I don't think it's very threatening. I mean, I, I don't say that lightly, but we've had far worse crises in our history where far more people died at a much higher rate. I, I mean, we're, we're all sitting here watching each other on Zoom. You know, there's not been massive civil unrest. The, the ICU beds are, you know, at a low level. Um, 
again, I think what might have worked in March and April is not going to work in May and June. I think that that's generally how I approach it. Once we have a better grasp on what this situation is, I think these sorts of the draconian regimes become far less difficult. I mean, in the early days, I did reporter interviews. I was like, yeah, this is probably okay. March, April, maybe not so much. Okay, May, ugh. and you get to June and July, I, I don't think the team's gonna fly anymore. Uh, another attendee asks, wouldn't courts still be able to consider constitutional issues even after the situation has passed uh, since the issue would otherwise elude review? Right, so courts are only able to consider live cases where there's still a controversy. But it's possible to seek what are called damages, money. And if you seek damages, that you can recover after the fact. And um, another question from Alex McGrath. Uh, he asks, does this pandemic reveal anything about the court's role in our constitutional structure? Courts will almost always be retroactive in their decision and can only tell the executive that she shouldn't have done something as opposed to preventing the action from happening. With many public health choices being irreversible, does this show courts to be weak? Yes, courts are very weak. Their, res their responsive institution is not proactive and they should not be proactive. I'm okay with courts trailing behind here. Um, I, I'm okay with it. I, again, maybe that's my, my joint issue of government, but I, I don't have high expectations for the courts. Um, looks like we have a question from Lisa Danini, and she wants to ask it live. So I'm going to let her um, ask her question live. All right, uh, Lisa, can you hear us? You fancy, Lisa? Oh. Oh. Hi. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So our next question from Robert. Um, and he says, not exactly a constitutional question, but analogous to a jury trial, what's your opinion about Congress deliberating remotely by Zoom? Yeah, really good question. Um, the current rules of Congress say that votes have to be cast in person. Um, now, I don't think there's anything in the Constitution that requires that. I think that uh, each house can set their own rules. And so long as there's some sort of really safe, verifiable way to make sure a person who's who say they are, I think that votes can be cast remotely. Um, uh, in other countries in the world, they have remote voting. In, in some state governments, they have remote voting. There's proxy voting. So I think the Constitution will permit it, but I'm not sure that um, uh, uh, there's any problems with it. Yeah, um, so a question for myself, and um, you briefly alluded to it. And I'm just wondering, in your opinion, how, how, do we, how does this end? You know, we're, you know, I remember in March, we were talking about finishing in April. In April, we were talking about finishing in May. And now there doesn't seem to be, you know, like a, a decisive timeline of when we're going to stop, you know, like you said, roll back these draconian measures. So in your opinion, you know, what's the end game here? Oh, God. You see the Avengers end game, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Captain can save us. Uh, you know, now we make it all go away. <laughs> um, Look, there is no end game. I mean, I don't say this lightly, but the 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 prospect of a vaccine might take years, and vaccines are not 100% effective. I, I think the end games that people are simply saying, okay, we're willing to have this where people die. I mean, it, it's, it sounds grotesque. I think the phrase people use is slow burn, slow burn. I think at some point, as a policy, say, okay, we can't get rid of this. We also can't live our lives inside. There's some level of death willing to accept. Gruesome, morbid, and I, I, people are going to be yelling and throwing stuff at your screen up. It, it's, it's true. Um, this has been brought upon us, this, this epidemic. We didn't ask for it. No one wanted it. You know, this is not like a man-made dilemma. We, we, we didn't cause this. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe. Well, it, this wasn't something that like was, you know, it was like climate change, for example, right? It wasn't like we were engaging in some activity for decades, but perhaps it was reversible, we chose not to, right? This is something that sort of just popped up out of nowhere and started killing people in vast numbers. And it might take years to wipe it off the earth. And in that, in that interim, there's not much government can do to stop us other than saying, wash your hands and wear a mask. And I think that's gonna be the answer. We wash hands, wear a mask, we go to classes online. And we pray this never happens again. But I, I, I don't see an end game in that, like, you know, Jonas Salt magically eradicates the disease tomorrow. That's not, that's not going to happen. I'm sorry. Gruesome. What, what, what an uplifting way to end this talk. <laughs> All right.
right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Blackman, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us uh, for this second installment in our uh, What I Would Have Said webinar series. Uh, so please stay tuned for more updates from the Buckley program. Uh, we continue to try to provide you with lots of interesting uh, content during quarantine. So thank you all for coming and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so thank much. You.